population decline. Sure. Can you give us a bit of a picture of what's happening globally? I think the UN's still saying that popular, global population will peak at around 11 billion, and they focus on Africa and the Middle East is still growing rapidly. But we learn, on the other hand, that China's population is in free fall, and there's a whole chunk of Western countries where population is starting to decline and will start to decline very rapidly uh, over the next decade, much faster than they are now. Uh, in fact, I think it may have been your term. We're actually looking at a depopulation bomb. May or may not have been your term. Can you give us a bit of a feel for what's happening? Sure. sure. Well, uh, as best we can tell, uh, total numbers in the world are going to be increasing for a while. But what we have been seeing over the last three generations, over the three post war uh, generations, is a relentless march all across the world to childbearing patterns uh, that will result in below replacement fertility, which is to say, not as many kids coming up to their parents' generation as, as necessary to replace that, that generation without immigration coming in or without some, uh, some sort of co immigration compensation. So uh, across the world as a whole today, something like three quarters of, the, of our planet's population lives in countries with below replacement fertility. Now we're used to thinking of rich countries as having below replacement fertility and virtue, almost all of them do, and almost all of them have for a while. But since you know that the rich countries only account for a very small share of the world's population, you couldn't get to three quarters of the world being below replacement unless mostly this is occurring in low income countries in so called third world countries. And it's, if you spin the globe, you see that all of East Asia is below replacement at this point, um, most of Southeast Asia. Um, in South Asia, India is a below replacement uh, population now. Bangladesh is below replacement. Nepal is below replacement at this point. An awful lot of countries in the Middle East, in the Uma, uh, are below replacement. Um, Turkey, Iran, Morocco, uh, places you wouldn't necessarily expect. And then, of course, when you come to the New World, um, Mexico, Brazil, uh, and a number of other Latin American countries are also below replacement societies, as well as practically all of the Caribbean. So this is the wave of the future. And this has been a relentless trend. There doesn't seem to be any uh, uh, end in sight. Demographers don't have any good theory for how low things go. Uh, what demographers do is they look in the rearview mirror and they say, oh, we know it can go this low now. We know that, for example, last year, we know that in South Korea, uh, the population of South Korea uh, could end up with a, on a tempo of just 0 0.8 births per woman per lifetime when you need almost three times that level for a society just to have stable population. This, of course, uh, is something we're only just beginning to come to grips with, and it is going to profoundly reshape the world in a whole range of ways. There are many who would say, well, that's a good thing. You know, uh, I run into well many people everywhere who think there are simply too many of us, um, and that for the sake of the environment and our future living standards and for a whole lot of other things, it would. this is a very welcome trend. There are some downsides, which you've highlighted, however. Uh, there are reasons to be quite concerned about these demographic shifts. Well, I wasn't one of the people who was uh, alarmed by the population explosion of the 19, you know, the late 20th century. Because even when I was a young student looking at this, I realized what was really driving it was a health explosion. 
and you know, if yeah. you're going to have a population problem, I'll take a health explosion any day. You know, just the improvement in life expectancy, reduction in disease, uh, all of the good things that come with increased human survival. Um, I think that there, uh, I think there's a lot of scope, even in a shrinking and aging world for maintaining and improving prosperity, uh, given the possibilities of improved health, given the possibilities of improved education, of uh, having a good business climate and an intelligent approach towards uh, pragmatic uh, free market uh, economies and generating more knowledge. Uh, but there definitely are um, consequences to uh, population decline driven by sub-replacement fertility. For one thing, the what I was trained to think of as a population pyramid with lots of kids on the bottom and few elderly people on the top kind of flips over. And uh, unless you do some very um, uh, adroit things with social policy, uh, you have the risk of having a sort of a Ponzi scheme going where you have a chain letter that can never uh, that can never do a pay-as-you-go for supporting an elderly population. Um, for another thing, unless you really make uh, lifelong learning a practice rather than a you know uh, a slogan people occasionally spout. Um, it's going to be very difficult to train and skill a gray labor force. Uh, but I think that really the most, um, the most important phenomenon to bear in mind when you have a, when you have uh, generations upon generations of uh, sub replacement fertility is that you have a revolution in the family where many, many people, um, uh, in practical terms, end up childless, end up not married or never married. And the human bonds that have been our social glue more or less forever start to become undone. And this takes us into a kind of a terra incognita, uh, which uh, gets us beyond the troubles that we can see with the head count, gets us into kind of the basic glue of society and questions about meaning and human existence. The, uh, my wife was pointing out to me the other day, she'd read something that said that once a population goes into free fall the way it is, say, for example, in China today, it's a relatively short time span before most children do not have siblings and they don't have aunts and uncles, to your well, point about social glue and, and a sense of place in, a, in the smallest community, if you like, a, a family. So China is an especially acute case here because they had this monstrous um, government uh, administered population control program from 1980 until 2015, the so-called one child program, you know, which was uh, really the, the most ambitious totalitarian program that I think any dictatorship has ever tried to implement it. When, uh, Lenin said we recognize nothing private, but before uh, Deng Xiaoping, none of the totalitarians had tried to invade the family unit and reconstruct it this way. Uh, it looks like they kind of succeeded and not in ways that they expected to. Uh, since the end of that program, uh, there has been a collapse in births and in marriages in China since they ended the program. Uh, Births dropped proportionately by more in the last five years than they did during the terrible famine under Mao. Uh, marriages much more, uh, and I think we we are uh, we are standing on a little hill where we can see some of the future that's coming in China, and we're going to we're going to see the atrophy. Uh, Call it the collapse. But we're going to see the atrophy and the withering away of the extended family in China. Um, and as you know, the extended family has been the family is the basic social unit everywhere. But family has been absolutely indispensable in Chinese civilization because it's been the 
protection for the little people against the absolute government that's ruled them you know, for thousands of years. And, and what happens next? Where is that protection going to come from? I don't think that we can see yet.